Step into the mystique with Paranormal M. Subscribe and turn on notifications to join us on our quest for the extraordinary. And if you have a second, do me a favor and drop a comment and put your suggestions on what things you might like to see in the next following episodes. Brace yourself for a mind-bending experience as we unveil the secrets of the paranormal with our latest tales. Can good spirits attach themselves to objects? I've had an experience with a, well, I don't want to say, but a bad spirit. But maybe a spirit that tried to grab me when I was about three. It was not a happy spirit, I'll say that. And it was attached to and under my bed. My aunt, who had that bed after we did, has confirmed that she's witnessed this spirit too. I've also bought a vintage briefcase that felt like bad juju years ago, and I had to get rid of that. Bad spirits attaching themselves to objects I've heard of plenty. But there is a painting I've found out in public, just out in the neighborhood in the heart of D.C. circa 2015. I brought it home. And, in the three different apartments I've had in D.C., I always felt there was something in the bathroom, which is where I kept this painting always. However, whatever it was felt friendly. Note, when I did sense that something was in my bathroom with me, I told it that it was welcome to stay, so long as it never hurt or scared me. I've witnessed a few things that support the idea that there was something there. In my home, each of my homes in D.C., and in the bathroom. Now I live in Savannah, but I keep this painting in my bathroom still. I don't feel a presence as strongly, but I've never felt there was anything bad living in either of my homes here. Last night I had a panic attack after seeing a photo of what looked like a bad spirit or demonic entity. I called a friend to help me down. The safest place I could find to sit and talk myself down was on the toilet. And that was with the lid closed and my pants on, in case you're wondering. My friend asked, especially out of curiosity, if quote-unquote Hector, the name of the painting, it's a cross between John Lennon and Hector Laveau, if he was in my house, and he was actually right behind me on the back of the toilet, my friend smiled. He said he believes there's something there, but that it's good, maybe even protective. And I'm kind of prone to believe this too. But has this ever been heard of? This is a bit of a long story, but this happened about 20 years ago. After my divorce, I kept possession of the house until it sold. In order to make the mortgage, I took on a roommate. He and I became good friends, and when the house sold, we moved into an apartment together. The place we got was one of the three apartments in a house that had long ago been converted. The owner was renovating the inside, and ours was the only apartment that was ready to move into. We had the entire second floor, in fact. It was a three-bedroom with a kitchen, a bathroom, a dining room, and a living room. All of the rooms except the bathroom had doors that led to the hallway, and then to the room next to it. In theory, one could run a circle through the entire place. I did some research the way back in the day, but the house was apparently a brothel. Not really sure if this had anything to do with each other or the rooms being connected or not. Anyway, we were the only tenants for almost a year. And during that time, a lot of odd things happened. I took the bedroom on the rear side of the apartment, while my roommate, I'll call him Tim, he took the frontmost. That left the room between us vacant, though this is not important. I had two jobs, a day and a night job. I worked at a local bar and a club. Tim only had a day job, and most nights he would come hang out at the club with me. Things started off slowly. Tim had an annoying habit of pacing while he talked on the phone. He would walk down the hall through the kitchen into the dining room and into the living room and back down the hall, 
every damn time. One night, maybe a month after we moved in, I was awoken to the sound of his voice and footsteps. I looked at the clock and it was well after one. This happened to be a night that I was not working. I kind of shrugged it off and went back to sleep. The next day when I saw Tim, I asked him who the hell he was talking to so late. He looked me in the eye and he told me to stop messing with him because he heard me talking and walking. A little more info on the house. It was a two-story, and it clearly was, with a basement and the main door and there's a security door. You entered into a shirt hall and ran next to the staircase leading to our apartment. Immediately on either side of the security door were the doors that opened to the two and the one-bedroom apartments. For most of the first year, getting to the basement was a challenge at best. The landlord had pulled the appliances from the two-bedroom apartment and put them in the short hallway. No one really needed to get to the basement anyway, and it was absolutely needed. We had to climb over the appliances. The entire house had those interconnected fire alarms, too. So, if the smoke alarm went off in the apartment one, all of them went off in every apartment. One Saturday, we were getting home from the club. And, as we pulled into the driveway, we could hear the sound of the smoke alarms going off. We immediately ran up the stairs to our place to make sure there was no fire. Important side note is, except for the smoke alarms, neither of the two first floor apartments had power. We did the whole waving at the alarms in every room to silence them to no avail. This clearly meant that one of the alarms in one of the apartments had been triggered. We scrambled over the mess on the lower hall and went down into the basement to find the breaker that controlled the alarms. As soon as I reached the bottom of the stairs, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was covered in goosebumps. Tim asked me if I felt it too. When I asked what he meant, he said he was being watched. I agreed. Besides three furnaces, the basement was empty. No place for anybody to hide, though we did circle the items to be sure. We tripped the breaker and silenced the alarms. Turning the breaker back on did not result in the alarms going off again, which they would have done had there been an actual fire. The next day, a Sunday, which meant the landlord would not be over to work, we called him to tell him of the ordeal. He showed up and did a walk-through inspection, especially the alarms. No one could figure out why they were going off. He commended us for stopping them, gave us a key to each empty apartment, and left. Sunday night came, and we both went to the club again. Came home to the same thing. This time, instead of heading right to the basement, we entered the other apartments to try to silence the alarms. Nothing we did worked. So, we returned to the basement. This went on every night that I worked at the club, until the apartments were filled. The night I had off, we went to bed. No alarms. It was like whatever it was that was triggering them was messing with us. Although, once the two downstairs apartments were filled, the alarms never went off again. There was a lot of other activity while we lived there. I still had my class ring at the time. It vanished from inside the small box I used to store that in my spare watch in. Just the ring. And ten years later, after I moved out... The landlord called me to tell me the newest tenant had a need to get onto the attic, and my ring was sitting on the top of the box that they had put up there when they moved in a year ago. We often heard footsteps and conversations from our apartment, and from the empty ones below us. The creepiest thing that had ever happened occurred after he had moved out. I was living in the apartment alone. I was seeking a new roommate or a smaller apartment. I was awoken by the feeling of something tugging on my foot. I looked around the room, which was well lit, because it was around nine in the morning. I always slept in as later as I could on those days, at least when I didn't have to work my regular day job. I didn't see anything until I got to the corner of the room by the door that led to the hallway. It was inexplicably dark, almost as if something was not allowing the light from my curtainless window to find that space. I got out of bed and walked toward it, shivers of cold running up my spine. 
As I got closer, the darkness gave way to light, and I saw the corner was empty. I shrugged it off, thinking maybe I had been dreaming, then not awake enough to actually see the corner. I climbed back into bed, and as soon as I drifted back to sleep, something yanked on my foot. It yanked hard enough to actually move my entire body toward the foot of my bed. I sat up and looked at the corner, again shrouded by absolute darkness, and at this, I got out of bed and stayed out. I actually left for the day. I was that creeped out. I thought I would share another story about my ghost encounters. About a week ago, I shared a story about a place I shared with a roommate. This is a story about an experience I had living alone. As I stated, after ten years, I moved away from the apartment I shared with the roommate into a second-floor apartment. This, too, was once a larger home, but had been converted into two separate units. The first floor was still used as a house. The people that owned it had turned the second story into an apartment for their daughter. When she moved out to get married, they decided to rent it out. It had one entrance via a door that was 15 feet from their entrance. This door led to a flight of stairs. At the top of the stairs, the bathroom door was directly across, with the entrance to the bedroom to the right. Going left took you through the very small kitchen and then the living room. I especially liked the living room as it was huge, and two of the walls had half doors built into it. They were used as storage. I moved in and the first week or so was peaceful and uneventful. After about a week, I woke up one night to go to work. I worked overnights in a factory. I went into the living room to sit on my couch and chill before heading out and found all of the storage doors wide open. There were six in total. I closed them, thinking maybe I'd been looking for something in them before going to bed and forgot. I don't know. While I had had experiences with the paranormal most of my life, I had never encountered an entity that would move objects. I went to work and came home. I immediately checked the doors and they were still closed. And as an explanation, the doors did not have nose. Maybe they meant knobs. They had a latch that you had to twist in order to open them. Kind of hard to explain. I made myself some dinner, watched a movie before heading off to shower. I have always, even when living alone, been the type that closes the bathroom door whenever I'm in it. I get undressed and start the shower and hear a knock at the main door. I throw on my pants, exit the bathroom, and head down the stairs to find no one at the door. I was thinking whomever it was must have left before I could answer. I went upstairs to shower. It is important to note that I was alone in the entire house. Both of the owners worked during the day. I returned to the bathroom, closed the door, dropped my pants, and hop in the shower. No sooner do I get soaked than there is yet again another knock on the bathroom door. And I'm not talking a nice, soft, rapping sound. Someone is pounding on the door. After I crawl back into my skin that I just jumped out of, I shout out a what? I thought maybe, just maybe, one of my landlords had come home and knocked downstairs, failing to answer. Maybe they'd gone to get their key and let themselves in. Well, no one answered my question. I just stood there, frozen in place, unsure of what my next action should be. Hearing nothing more after a couple of minutes, I grab my bar of soap and start to wash. Bang, 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 bang on the door again. Hard enough to jar it in place. I am fully freaked out right now. I quickly rinse off and jump from the shower. Throw open the door, fully naked but not caring because somebody was about to get their ass kicked. No one was there. I quickly check out the apartment, dripping water everywhere, but find it empty. I even check the closets, the storage doors, and under my bed. I run down the stairs and find my door locked. There are no other cars in the driveway. It was then that I got the familiar feeling of being watched. I sprint and look up the stairs, and I can feel it up there looking back at me. I run up the stairs, 
saying as calmly as I can that this is not welcome and that it needs to leave. I go back to the bathroom to finish my shower, and as soon as I close the door behind me, it gets pounded on again. I mean, the second my hand left, you know. I wanted nothing more than to finish my shower, so I opened the door, just got back in. The water had started to turn cold at this point, so I finished quickly. For the three years I lived there, I could not close the bathroom door to even pass without it being pounded on. The storage doors would open randomly, but the worst experience I had while living there was the time I headed to bed. It was around two. I was walking toward my bedroom when the door slammed shut before I could get there. I slept on the couch that day. I tried, as I always do, to tell them that they were not welcome and to sage to salt, but... I believed then as I do now that these places are not haunted, but it is me that attracts these entities. The talking and saying and salting never works for me. My first ever encounter with ghosts at 14. As the title says, my lifelong encounters with ghosts started when I was 14. A bit of backstory. I lived at the end of a dead-end street. Directly across the road from my house was an old man that lived with his sister. They had inherited the house from their parents. Beside their house was just a cornfield, and beside it was a large field. My friends in the closest store were on the other side of that field. He was a nice old man and allowed us to cross through his lawn to get to the field instead of having to walk all the way up the road and then backtrack down the main road. It is also important to this story to point out that there is a patch of trees between the two different fields. It wasn't very big, maybe 15 feet thick, but it did run the entire length of both fields and we would have to walk through it when taking the shortcut. It is also important to point out that there was a large, dilapidated barn on the edge of the property line. It belonged to whoever owned the cornfield. I ended up getting a job at the little store that I mentioned earlier. I went in every night from 7 until 9. I stocked the coolers and sorted out the bottle returns by vendor. Even in the summer, I would walk home in the dark. I had never had a good feeling when I would walk past the barn. I always felt as if something was watching me and my skin would crawl. But the shortcut saved me 20 minutes of walking, so I always used it. One night while I was walking to work in the winter, I got to the patch of trees. It was dark as dark could be, the nearest street light well over a football field's length away. The only light was from the full moon. The area where I crossed was swampy and there was always standing water. Being winter, the water was frozen over and to my left. I was about halfway through the patch of woods when my skin began to crawl in earnest. I heard a sharp crack from the ice to my left. Anyone that's ever walked over ice that was not solid enough to support their weight knows the sound of a foot breaking through it. That was the sound that I heard. I froze mid-step, worried that there was some sort of animal there. I slowly turned to look at the source of the sound and saw this black figure looking at me from around 20 feet away. Even typing this so many years removed from the experience, it gives me goosebumps. I knew instantly that this was neither a wild animal nor a living person. I could make out the trees behind it, but it was not really see-through, but kind of transparent. It's difficult to articulate exactly. It also lacked any real form. Its head was shaped like a person, but it had no arms or legs that I could see. As I stood there glued in place, it started to move toward me. This was all it took to break me from my spot. To say that I ran fast would be an understatement. The snow was about eight inches deep in the field, and I'm pretty sure that I could have set an Olympic record got to the main road and crossed it to the store. I stood outside for some time before catching my breath. The entire two hours I worked, I kept getting chills and my eyes would water. 
At nine, when the store closed, I was to head home. I stood by the edge of the road to gather my courage. Finally, I crossed the road and entered the field. As I got closer to the patch of trees, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I knew I was no longer alone. I broke into a sprint again, feeling like I was running for my life. If there was something waiting for me, I never saw it. For the next few weeks, every time I would take the shortcut at night, I would get the same sensation. Eventually, I caved and started to take the long way. This spirit, ghost, demon, whatever it was, stayed with me until I graduated high school and moved. I went on an exchange trip to France, and I was out hiking in the Alps and I saw it there. My host's family's son also saw it, so I knew I was not imagining it. I have shared some experiences from my past, now for something more recent. As I've gone through life, I've moved a few times. Each time it takes time for the hauntings and visits and encounters, whatever you want to call them, to resume. About four years ago I moved to another state. I've been employed for the last 20-ish years as a plant manager the guy in charge of manufacturing company. A new company opened within a few weeks of me moving, and I got to the position there of running the place. The building was already there, and the new company just bought the property. This meant that I was responsible for hiring the staff and setting up the plant to produce. The first month we were there, it just was me and another guy. We were mostly doing cleaning as the former owners had left quite a mess behind. I was never the kind of boss to sit on my ass while my employees did everything. So I decided the, well, to make the plant into sections, so each of us worked independently on a given section at a time. I've always felt as though I attracted these entities, but this building must have had some history too. It started out simply enough. I would be working and I would hear my name being called. When I would go check with one employee, he would always deny calling to me. As the boss, I always arrived before anyone else. This was true even in the beginning. I would get to work and all the lights would be on, though I knew I had turned them all off the night before. The fridge door would be standing open and neither of us was using it yet. Tools and cleaning supplies would move from where they were left. Still nothing grand by any means. It was not until about a year after we were up and running that the experiences became more extreme. There would be days, days when I was on my office and just working mornings and I would hear muffled conversations through the wall. For context, my office wall was shared with the entryway and where the employees would come in daily. That's when I would go out to see who had arrived. So there was really never anybody out there. And the only lot had my car. Shortly after this started, I was out on production floor talking to my crew. I always make it a point to socialize with them individually so they know that I'm invested in them as a person, which I truly am. My only woman employee, and I'll simply call her Jay, she ran the last machine in line and she was always the last person I got to. When I approached her, she looked nervous which was quite unlike her. I asked her what was up. Jay explained to me that she was sensitive to spirits, and since she had started, she had heard voices calling her name. That morning, though, she had seen a man standing behind her machine, watching her with a look of malice on his face. When she went around the machine, the man had vanished. Another part of my job was watching the security footage every night. The owner was paranoid about theft, and beside my office in the restrooms, there was not a spot inside or out of the property that was not watched 24-7. The cameras had night vision and motion detectors, so the review screen would alert me to times I should really pay attention to. At first, there would be indications of movement where I could not see anything. I chalked this up to a mouse or something moving in the camera's view, but too small to make out. 
That all changed about a month later. We only ran one shift. Everyone, including me, left at 3.30 daily. And as I said, a month give or take a few days after the empty footage, I notice every day that there is a timestamp from one camera at exactly 3.45. When I would review the footage, it was always the same. From seemingly out of nowhere, orbs would appear, hundreds and hundreds of them. They would fly almost like a flock of birds, one way, then the other in front of the camera. When they changed direction, it was in unison, again like a flock of birds. It always lasted from 30 to 50 minutes before they would vanish. We didn't have forced air for heat, so I knew it was not just dust being blown around, and as I said, it was only one camera which happened to be mounted to the wall outside of my office. I showed the footage to Jay one morning. She agreed that this was not a natural event. It still goes on to this day, as do the voices. I've seen people that were not there as well, but whenever I go look at the footage, they're never there. I think I had a spirit attached to me. Remembered something from years ago. Thought I would share and also get other people's thoughts. Back when I was a freshman in college, probably around January 2018, I would have the same dream every night for three months. Some nights I wouldn't have the dream, but I would still wake up the next day or in the middle of the night with the same feeling. The dream would go like this. I would wake up in my dream lucid almost, but would be staring at myself. I wasn't in bed, in fact, I was in a completely gray world. No walls or floors to, you know, indicate a sense of where I was at. But it did feel empty, despite me laying in the middle covered in whatever blanket I was sleeping in that night. There would be a slow zoom at my figure, and suddenly it would shift to where I was now in my body, with my eyes wide open. I would feel a presence behind me laying down next to my own sleeping body as black hair creeped over my eyes that was not my own. I had short brown curly hair at the time. As the hair covered my vision, I felt something or someone go close to my ear and whisper, Turn around and I'll kill you. As she said, kill you, and yes, it was a creepy female voice, I would wake up and be staring at my wall. I would also feel like the presence was still behind me, and every time I turned around, there was nothing. Nothing but the weight behind me seemed to lift off the bed as if, like, me turning around maybe scared it off. I never was afraid of this woman, and I always felt as if she was kind of protective of me. At the time, I was also going through a very mentally abusive relationship, so this may have been a trigger but the dream would always go to the exact same way. And funnily enough, after I broke up with this asshole a couple of months later, I stopped having this dream. And I've not really seen anything or felt her at all since then. But I always felt like I knew what she looked like. Long black hair, long white dress, and a bent neck, like the bent neck lady from the stories. This was also before the haunting of Hill House show, so I couldn't really have had any influence from that. The Night My Granddad Died, A Shared Experience So for context, my granddad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer back in 2008. He passed away not long after. The same year at the time I was 16 years old, but didn't really comprehend how sick my granddad was, nor did I realize that he was never really coming out of the hospital. My family had downplayed the severity of his illness. For added context, I was extremely close with my grandparents, and my granddad in particular. He was my best friend, my father figure and mentor. Sorry to my cousins, but well, I was also his favorite grandchild, confirmed by my nan. So the night my granddad passed away, I had an incredibly vivid dream that I was in this hospital room with him. He was saying his goodbyes to me, 
let me know how proud he was and that everything would be okay and to take care of my nan. And I, too, got to say my goodbyes to him. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling completely calm and at peace, and I had accepted my grandfather's passing. Within what seemed to be minutes of walking home, the phone rang. My parents received a phone call from the hospital saying that my granddad had passed away. I popped my head out of my bedroom. I asked my mom if he'd passed away while they were getting ready, and she said yeah. I went straight back to bed, again feeling calm and at peace. The following morning, once my parents returned from the hospital, with my nan too, I told my mom about my dream. She went pale in the face and told me to repeat what I'd told her to my nan. My nan had more or less had the exact same dream during the night again. She was in his hospital room. He was saying his goodbyes to her, and he was reassuring her that everything would be okay. And she got to say her goodbyes, and she too woke up at peace, knowing what had happened before receiving the call. Never confirmed the times of our dreams, but believed them to have happened around the same time, given the phone calls. To this day, I don't know what to make of it. I wouldn't have given it as much thought if my nan hadn't had the same dream. But yeah, the odds of the two people having the same dream relating to the same person in the same setting and context that same night kind of blows my mind. Brought me so much comfort during that dark time and still does to this day. I genuinely believe I was a witness to something beyond our realm. I think about it often, and I have no logical explanation for my nan and I sharing this experience. I would tend to agree with you. saw my ex-father-in-law a few weeks after he died. My ex-father-in-law was an untypical person. His entire life he believed that he had the gift. He would do tarot readings for a living, believed he could predict future events even. He once told my mother-in-law that she couldn't go to Birmingham. Apparently he thought it was going to blow up. And I never liked him, not his beliefs, but was cruel, and he was also pretty incredibly stupid. He said the Holocaust didn't happen. So he was a part of my life unwillingly, you could say. He never liked me either, but then he got sick, got an ulcer on the back of his neck that was going into his brain. He refused medical treatment as he said it was the government doing it to stop him from publishing a book. His wife believed him about everything. Months later, he got so sick, we as a family said that he had to go to the hospital. He did, and then came back a few weeks later, had a huge stroke and died in what was their living room. Well, their little living room. It's like a typical room used as a living room, and that was his occult room. When he died, his wife called my partner, her son, and we ran straight over. He was being worked on, but clearly dead. About two months after this, my mother-in-law, my partner, her son, and her other son were going out for the day. The mother-in-law, who I was very close to, asked me if I could make the living room that he died in into an office for her. My ex-father-in-law was very specific in his life about the house, wouldn't allow change or getting rid of anything. He was very, very anti-it. So I'm by myself moving crap dragging a desk. Then I see him. He's in the garden looking through the window. Not at me. He doesn't acknowledge me at all. He puts his head through the window and he looks back and forth at the space and then disappears. He was wearing the exact outfit he did. Like a striped top and light cargo trousers. He looked exactly like him but almost slightly see-through. It didn't scare me at all called his wife to tell her what happened. She was overcome with emotions and felt guilty that she had changed the room around. No one ever saw his ghost again, though. I was sad that out of all the people I've known and truly loved, well, I get to see this idiot who I disliked while he was alive. In 
encounters I've had, looking for feedback on it. I was living at home still. I was maybe 17, maybe 18. We lived in a raised ranch house. My room was the basement. To enter my living space from outside, you had to first go into the garage, walk through the garage, enter a laundry room, then go through another door to enter my room. Three doors in total. Now when you opened the middle door, it would create a vacuum and the third door would jiggle in the jam. This way I always knew when somebody was coming into my room because I'd see the door move before somebody came walking in my friends. They would like routinely come in at any hour of the day too. So I'm on the couch back to the door. I had the TV on listening to ESPN. I hear the TV and I'm fully aware. My back is to the TV in the door. I hear the door wiggle. A few seconds later I hear the door open. I see a light flood into the room. I feel someone there. I begin to roll over to see who just has entered my room. I literally can't even move though. I can't move my body and I can't roll over. I'm frozen. I'm also petrified. I'm scared stiff. I feel terror. I feel dread. Again, I can't move. I can't talk. I tried and I did see the lights from the TV flickering around the room. I did see the light from the middle room on the wall behind me. All of a sudden, I hear the door close. Everything returned to normal. And I went to sleep like nothing happened. First and last time it happened. Second experience, look up a ghost of... Well, excuse me. Second experience, look up ghost at Professor Java, Wolf Road, Albany, New York. I was born there. You'll read about a ghost I saw, and that ghost followed that ghost into an empty room at the cafe. Visited an abandoned manor and heard voices. Some years back, I were to go on a camping trip to the woods with a friend and my partner. Since I like to take photos, my friend suggested we visited a big abandoned manor that he knew of in the area. We were to set up camp there. The place is very desolate, with only one small residential house in sight. It was situated maybe a kilometer from the manor, only visible due to a flat landscape. Due to all the broken glass inside the manor, our friend was walking around outside with his dog, while me and my boyfriend explored the inside. We walked up some stairs and entered a room, and that's where I got an eerie feeling. And for some reason, I kind of felt it had something to do with children. I just told my partner I didn't like how that room made me feel. I would go downstairs again. He continued to explore the upstairs further and then came to join me downstairs. And that's when we heard it, like a gust of echoes passing right past us. Children's laughter. Me being the only person in the company with a tendency for superstition, I asked my partner, Did you also hear that? He said, That was children. We shouted to our friend if there was anybody but him outside, and he answered that there was a car driving around the courtyard, and for some reason this made us discard what we heard as children outside. Although it felt like it passed us. Fast forward to later that night. We're laying in the woods ready to sleep. I suddenly realized something. I poked my partner and I said, We talked to those people in the car. There were no children with them. It was a young woman practicing for a driver's license with her teacher in a place with no traffic. There was no one else in sight. My partner, who's not superstitious, said about this place, I'll never go back there unless it's burnt down. The latter being a joke, of course. Ironically, the place burned down. Even the same part of the building where we had that experience. Presumed arson. I have tried to find other stories from the same place, but without luck. At least for specific stories. But I have seen plenty of people mentioning it as an extremely unpleasant and haunted location.
My husband's encounter in hospital when he almost died. My husband had a history of his heart rate dropping into the low 40s. This morning it started happening again, collapsed. He fell three feet off some steps. Once he got up, he woke me and said that I needed to call 911. He said something was different this time. By the time the paramedics got to him, his heart rate was down to 20. He was surrounded by a team of nurses and doctors trying everything to bring his heart rate up. This was when things got weird. They started to shock his heart, to get it into a normal rhythm. Each shock, he said, was extremely painful. During these shocks, my husband looks up in the room full of doctors and nurses. He sees an older lady. She's in normal clothing, no badge on, and she's approaching him. This is happening during all the chaos of multiple medical staff trying to save his life. The older woman reaches him, grabs his hand, whispers into his ear. She tells him not to worry and everything will be okay. As she's speaking to him, an incredible warmth filled his body. Any fear that he had had went away, and now he was calm. The woman then walks away. The shocks stop, and the doctors determine he needs an emergency pacemaker installed. He has the surgery within an hour. Surgery goes well. Then things get weirder. The ICU recovering. He shares this story with me. It's about a lady in the ER. And while sharing this story with me, he's very emotional and crying. I asked the nurse if there had been anyone in the ER that could have approached him like the old lady in street clothes did. She said, no way. Okay, this is definitely getting weirder. For context, my husband is 43 years old. Pretty much an atheist who really doesn't believe in ghosts or angels. Well, except for the time my dad passed away. There's a darker, more frightening story I may share another time. After a few days, he's released from the hospital. He goes home and I post this amazing story on Facebook. A couple of days pass, and our take on reality is shook to our core. I'm sleeping on this third day home. That's when I hear him screaming and crying. Oh my God, it's her. It's her, oh my God. I run to the room that he's in and he's bawling. I ask what's wrong and he shows me a picture on his phone. It's an obituary. It featured a picture of an old lady. It's her. He cries. The obituary was a text to him from a close friend of ours. She had seen my post about his ER experience. She had decided to do a search of deaths in the hospital the morning my husband was in the ER. In doing so, she came across an obituary. The lady I was looking at had died around the same time he was in the ER at the same hospital. What the fuck? Odd man standing in the back of my garden. About eight years ago, maybe more, I remember very vividly a tall, slender male figure standing in the very back of my garden. He was wearing a rather old-fashioned clothing, a long black trench coat, a top hat, and he appeared to have black shoes that matched the attire. I have a rather large back garden, and my kitchen window looks out onto about half of it. The rest of it is toward the side of my house and I remember I was standing in the kitchen looking out. He was right in the corner of the garden near wooden gate that used to connect to the railway lines that are just behind the garden. This was removed quite a while later as it was deemed unsafe and damaged by the wind. It was getting dark out, but just light enough so I was able to see. I remember the image so well because he looked so insanely creepy. I ended up doing some research about the area I live in a couple years ago. Found out that there used to be a few bomb shelters scattered along the railway line. They were used in the war. One or two of them still remain behind my garden to this day. He looked like he could have been straight out of the war or in hiding. 
I've recalled this story so many times to my mother as she was in the kitchen with me at the time. She knows I haven't been able to let it go since. I could draw it, I remember it so well. I don't remember if he left or if I moved away or he disappeared, but it felt like I was looking at him for a very long time. I was just trying to figure him out. I don't recall any expression on his face, but from his posture he seemed deflated and zombie-like almost, as if he'd been through a lot and looking for help. I've also had multiple sightings in my home of a young boy wearing similar attire, top hat, polished shoes, black blazer, knee-high white socks. My mom has seen him on multiple occasions, too, and even though it's been years since I last saw either of them, I think about them a lot. It makes sense to me that they were both from the war times. Did my old pet cat visit me? I, a 28-year-old female, live alone with one cat, a 10-year-old male. He's very close with me. He comes to the door to greet anybody like a dog would. And he's a good listener. Come, no, get down, stuff like that. He messes with spiders and stink bugs indoors, and watches and hunts birds through the window, but couldn't care less about squirrels. Not even neighborhood dogs. Not sure if he's ever encountered a mouse. The only times he's gone outside the litter box is when I've been out of the house for too long or at my boyfriend's place four nights in a row, for example. Or perhaps the very rare occasion the door to his litter box area is closed accidentally. When those times did occur, he peed on my bed without fail. I learned to honor his bond with me by being home consistently, closing my bedroom door when I'm not home. We'd been problem-free for over a year. He can't frickin' live without running water. Despite the cat fountain, he is always up on the bathroom sink asking for a drink. My first ever pet, Cad, almost made it to 18. She passed one year ago, which is 2623. She was also a huge fan of running water, and in her more youthful years would see us on the way to the bathroom and race us to the sink or tub to wait patiently for us to turn it on for her. Last night, which is this morning, the 7th technically, I got up to pee at 6 a.m., my cat heard me and came in from the living room. At the bathroom door open, I can see the front door of my apartment. From the toilet and tub to the left, vanity to my right, my cat sat on the floor between me and the bathroom door. I saw a flit of something about my head height. It was in my right periphery, which would be roughly the right side of vanity above the sink bowl. I do take sedative medication at night, so I second-guess myself at first. Maybe it was just a messy bun frizz over my ear that I saw. But my cat saw what I saw and was immediately alert. He stood up, jumped on the sink, jumped down, trotted over to the front door, sniffed the crack of the doormat, trotted back and veered into my bedroom out of sight. I checked my door, closets, and windows. There was nothing funny going on. Went back in my room and my cat had peed on my bed and was pawing, just covering it up. I don't want to anthropomorph oh, sorry. I don't want to anthropomorphize, but I've never seen him act like that, and it did feel like pretty good kitty guard behavior. Checked the entry point, marked my bed to keep whatever was away from me and my human spot. I heard nothing and I smelled nothing. I didn't get any sensory feelings like the room's cold all of a sudden or hair standing up that I've heard about. All I felt was unease because I know that he saw it too. He was visibly on edge for a little under five minutes. Other thoughts went through my mind. Bird? Bat? But there was nothing flying around or trying to get out after that moment. No birds, no bugs. I didn't think it would make sense for it to be a mouse, at least at head's height in the bathroom. Flying mouse. Stink bug makes more sense in that respect, but I can't imagine him acting that way from a bug sighting. 
My only other explanation currently is that my beloved old cat visited me on the one-year anniversary of her death to get a sink drink. The devastating part is I flushed and walked the path my live cat took and the thought it could have been my past kitty didn't dawn on me until I remade the bed and settled back down. So if it was her, I didn't turn the faucet on for her. I don't feel safe anymore and I'm getting desperate. I would generally consider myself a skeptic. I don't really believe in this kind of stuff, usually. But I've been having some strange experiences. I don't have anything else to turn to, so I hope this might get some answers. Or at the very least, rule out some options. Okay, so where do we even begin with this? It started a few months ago. My house is small and only has three tiny bedrooms. The majority of the time I've lived here, there were five people. I shared a room with my sister up until October of 2023 when my brother moved out and she took his old room. A while after that is when I started to notice odd things. At first, it was generally paranoia. In my room, and usually only in my room for at least an hour before I go to sleep, I get this, like, really paranoid feeling. It could be a feeling of being watched or being hyper-aware of noise, but I would be really anxious. Then things picked up a bit. I started to feel something hovering over my ear, never really seeing anything but feeling it deeply. That tickle when someone whispers, you know? Kind of like that. It was just hovering over my ear. This only happens to my right ear. It just so happens that when I lay to my left side, I face a mirror as it's close to my closet door. Apparently, that's bad luck, I hear. Anyways, it goes on from here. One night as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard a man clearly whisper, Stay awake, in my right ear, which scared the shit out of me for obvious reasons. I felt that same hovering and watched feeling. Lately, I've noticed things moving across my vision. Shadows in the corners of my eyes and little white blurs across my vision. This only really happens in my bedroom and not much else. I've noticed something worse when I'm asleep. I often sleep with my hand under my pillow. Sometimes my hand peeks out from under the pillow and then it happens. Something is grabbing my hand. It starts my index finger and pulls slightly on it as if I'm trying to be discreet. Then it works its way to my pinky. Then it goes back to the index finger, only this time it makes small circular motions with it pressing it on my pillow lightly. It does this with each one until it reaches my pinky. Then after that it shakes my headboard. I've also noticed my mattress shake slightly while I sleep, which is definitely not normal. As far as I can recall, this is all the detail I have as of now. I'm worried I have a ghost of some kind. I'm also worried because my mental illness runs in my family. My grandpa had schizophrenia. So, Reddit, I ask you. Do I have a ghost or should I be evaluated instead? And if I do have a ghost, what can I do about it? What do you guys think? Paranormal Experience in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Anyone else? In the summer of 2022, I stayed in Pagosa Springs, Colorado in an Airbnb. For context, I'm a 30-year-old female. I was traveling solo. The Airbnb was about two miles outside of the main downtown area, so it wasn't exactly remote but it was in an area with little light pollution and not necessarily close to any businesses. That day I walked around town visiting the local hot springs, going into a few of the shops. I mentioned this because I had Texas plates, and I wondered if maybe somebody followed me from town to my Airbnb knowing that I was traveling alone. At 10 p.m. somebody knocked on the door, and in a scared voice it said, Are you there? I had an immediate sense of dread and fear and ducked into the kitchen where I couldn't be seen from the window. I dialed 911 and explained the situation. 
I was on the phone with dispatch for five minutes before the cops showed up. The entire time the voice repeated, Are you there? Are you there? In the same scared inflection, not yelling in no other words, just, Are you there? Even though the voice remained consistent, the banging on the door was aggressive. They rang the doorbell over and over. My two dogs were barking and going crazy, but that didn't seem to deter whoever or whatever was outside from continuing to bang on the door. The Airbnb had a clear view of the road, and whoever was outside could have 100% seen a car coming from a decent distance away. For 20 seconds, the banging stopped, and dispatch told me the cops were outside. When I opened the door, no one was there other than the cops. Whoever had been banging on the door for five minutes ran away when they saw cops coming. Now I've considered it. Maybe it could have been a drunk person, but there were no bars nearby and there was never somebody's name as if there was the wrong house or even the word help. They just continuously repeated, Are you there? Deaths on the Plot I have recently found out about my maternal great-grandparents, which on their grave plot occurred two strange deaths that occurred in the same time of each other. The paranormal event itself took place 40 years ago in 1980. I was born in 2001, so I didn't know my great-grandparents, and I was also fostered too. I was told by my biological mom's best friend Kay, as she's a scholar, especially on my maternal family history. She told me the story in October of 2023 where we met each other while shopping. I live in Merseyside, Cheshire, in the northwest of England. My great-grandparents' plot is in Halton Village Cemetery. The name of my grandparents is Sissy and Harold. Both died in 1980. The strange deaths involved Harold and their pet animal Peaches, whom died in a short space of each other at the graveside. I will provide a picture in the headstone to further illustrate this. The story is as told by Kay, and that's that Sissy died of natural causes on the 24th of October. That's in 1980 again. And that was a harrowing time for Harold. He lost his soulmate and a few months later while visiting Sissy's graveside, he died unexpectedly. She was buried there on the 11th of December, 1980. The dog Peaches also died at Harold and Sissy's graveside. Both are buried together. Peaches was taken in by another couple, and that dog unexpectedly ran away and passed away at the graveside. Kay described it as an unexplainable strange, and that there could be a paranormal dimension to this or that they died of a broken strange. But it is a perplexing situation nonetheless. A broken strange. Hmm. I saw blue sparkling lights. A close family friend and co-worker had recently died of cancer. I had been heartbroken, often crying while I cooked dinner because I of course had to put his obituary up in my fridge to remind me. Well, one night around that time I had just finished putting our plates on the dinner table and the coffee table in the living room and then back into the kitchen to grab the salt and pepper. About halfway into the kitchen I realized all these blue sparkling lights were around me. They were everywhere, and they were beautiful. There had to be thousands of them. They were sort of swimming and falling all over me. I sort of twirled in place in awe of it. After getting over how cool it was, I started to think if it was probably an eye thing, like standing up too fast. So I closed my eyes. I saw nothing. When I reopened them, all the lights were still there. I actually got a little nervous thinking that this was like a trick of the eye situation, but it was lasting entirely too long. I stood there watching and contemplated the possibility that I was having a stroke, until they all started leaving. They left in a 
kind of a pretty way, like fading one by one until a few were only left. Eventually they were all gone, and I was just left dumbstruck. I did some research the next day at work and found that it might actually be a sign of retinal detachment. Although I didn't find my exact experience in the symptoms I did, well, they say that you can see flashing lights. I wore glasses, so I eventually made it to an eye exam and I asked them about it. The doctor said my eyes were fine. Sometimes weird things happen, but... They didn't seem concerned about it. That was around three years ago. I recently moved, so I'm no longer in that house and haven't experienced anything like it since. No shadowy figures with top hats either. <laughs> Until this morning, my husband was taking a shower while I was brushing my hair in front of the sink when the little sparkling lights started popping up and floating around me. There was nobody nearby. And there weren't as near many of these things as last time either, but it was still beautiful. As quickly as they appeared, they began fading away though, one by one until there was only one left. I thought about reaching out to touch it, but by the time I started lifting my arm, it was gone. It felt like something was saying hi. Something paranormal, or possibly neurological, I don't know. But it was an experience. The Shadowy Figure The current house I've been living in for the last 21 years used to have signs of paranormal presence that at least one of my family members encountered at least once with me having the pleasure to encounter it one night too. So backtracking to the first encounters, the residence of the house was my father and mother and grandmother and uncle and my two younger siblings and I. My youngest sibling was around five, stayed in my grandma's room because she raised him while my mom worked. My uncle also stayed in that room too. My uncle used to haunt for sport, so his guns and ammo were always under his bed. I shared a room with my sister, but I slept on the floor, and she for the bed since she was the girl. Last was my parents' bedroom. It was always a talk during breakfast that supposedly my uncle had seen a shadowy presence in the house. I would always dismiss it as him trying to scare us since we were young and my grandma superstitious. I would listen to the stories and then get a chill, but would always dismiss them. One day my grandma joined us at the table for breakfast. Everyone was already eating. My grandma scolds my younger brother. Something along the lines of why he never came out of the restroom last night after she walked him. He seems confused. So according to her, he had woken her up in the middle of the night and asked her to walk him to the restroom since he was scared. Half asleep, she got up and walked him and waited for him outside the door. But it seemed to be taking forever, so she walked back to her bed and went to sleep. My brother was confused because he said he never got up. My mother backed him up by saying that he had, well slept in her bed last night and never got up once. There was a silence, and then everyone broke out in laughter, teasing my grandma that the ghost had gotten her to walk to the restroom. My grandma got flustered, red-faced in embarrassment, saying it wasn't funny. I laughed, but at the same time thought she couldn't have dreamt it, ever skeptical. The second encounter was my sister. One night while I was in deep sleep, I was woken up by her stepping over me so she can exit the room to the restroom. I quickly squinted my eyes and fell back asleep. Morning came. I was eating breakfast and she looked pissed. That wasn't funny. You must be so delighted thinking you were going to scare me. I was confused and my mom asked her what had happened. According to her, she woke up to use the restroom, which I do remember. But... After she used it, she was walking back to the room and saw me standing outside the room, waiting to lunge at her and scare her. She told me to stop that it wasn't funny and she looked away for a bit and didn't see me. She thought I quickly went back into the room to feign being asleep. I was so confused, I swore as much as I loved scaring others for a good laugh that I didn't get up last night. I did confirm that I did see her walk out, but I never got up. 
She looked at me as if I was lying, and everybody teased her, saying it was the ghost. I asked her if she saw me. She said no, but it was like a shadow, and she assured that it was me. Now I was feeling kind of scared, not so skeptical anymore. A few months had passed. We all agreed as long as we don't bother the ghost, nothing would happen. Maybe it's friendly, like Casper or something. Now it was my turn. My uncle had left the house for a week to go hunting. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling thirsty, so I got up to go to the kitchen to get a glass of water. The way the furniture was arranged, it made the path from the living room to the kitchen a bit narrow, so only one person can pass it at a time. I bring this up because in front of me, like ten feet away, there's a figure in my way. I just assume it to be my uncle who's had a habit of getting a glass of water in the middle of the night. So as usual, we both kind of just, you know, get by and I turn and sidestep him to get past him. He does so likewise. I go to drink my glass of water and start making my way back to my room. My uncle once again is standing in the way, so I sidestep him. Then it hits me. My uncle isn't home, then who the heck is this? stop for a moment, my fear just imagines a scary face from a horror movie, a face I don't want to see. This is the shadowy figure. I run to my room as if in chase sequence. I jump in bed under my covers, curled into a ball, my heart racing as if this was a threat that would actually stop it. I drift into sleep and wake up wishing it was a nightmare, but I knew it wasn't. I get up and go to my parents' room to tell them what I just experienced. They looked at me to see if I'm not joking for a moment, and I assure them I wasn't kidding that I finally had an experience with this ghost or whatever it was. Years pass. I tell this story to my friends. One of them believes in the paranormal and he tells me about shadow people. That's possibly what I could have seen. Maybe it was a shadow person. I take some interest and do some research and conclude it might be because for everybody's encounters, we never saw a face but just assumed it was one of our family members. I decide if that's what it is. Well, what can we do? Just let it be. As the year goes, I make friends with someone who supposedly sees paranormal things and whatnot. I'm skeptical in his gift, but after experiences in my house, I believe such stuff could exist. One day on July 4th, I invite him over since he's going to be alone and I kind of felt bad. He takes the bus to my house and I invite him in. I seat him in the living room, ask him if he wants some barbecue, so I get him a plate from outside. As I come back, we go to my room so we can watch TV and video games. As he sits down, he tells me, Hey, I don't want to scare you, but there's an old man sitting in your living room couch. My heart skips a beat. I've never told him about my house or what we experienced there. So him seeing a single entity freaks me out. He doesn't mean harm, he just stays in this house. I told him to stop. I explain why it's freaking me out in the encounters that we had. He nods and says, yeah, all those encounters must have been him. I don't know if he's messing with me, but I no longer want him in my house. I tell him sorry, but he needs to leave. I get up and he follows me. I'm sorry, but I don't feel comfortable and you shouldn't have told me that. Are you scared? Kinda, but I think it's better if you left for now. I open the gate, and he walks out. I feel kinda bad, but my fear is greater. He texts me. Don't be afraid, or he'll know. Just be calm. I ignore him, and I decide to stay outside for the remainder of the evening. I never talk to him again, not wanting to be part of that world. The encounters stopped since then but I'm not sure if I ever bring them up to my family they would ever really remember. See ya.